May Jesus and Mary be loved by all hearts. Today we're going to begin line by line, reflections on the secret of La Salette. In the very first line of the secret, Our Lady told Melanie that it could be published in 58, presumably in 1858, 12 years after the apparition in 1846. Melanie used every means at her disposal, and when people complained that the words were harsh, she replied that Mary had told her to make it known to all the people. I'll be following the French texts which were discovered in the Vatican archives in 1999 and published by Father René Laurentin. There, in a very old envelope, were the texts of Mary's messages in the children's own handwriting and opened by Pope Pius IX in 1851. His successor, Pope Leo XIII, studied them and called Melanie to Rome to discuss them further. Melanie couldn't get an imprimatur from the French bishops, so the Pope encouraged publication through an Italian bishop. The secret hit the press in 1878. I have worked with a team for several years to arrive at the best consensus for translating these texts into English. I'm actively looking for a book publisher now. So why are there so many wild translations on the internet? Because throughout the 1800s, French Catholics were very much divided. <clears throat> Not unlike our present day Catholics tend to align themselves as liberal and conservative. In 1878, the conservative camp interpreted the secret as a word from heaven against the liberals. But since the secret is partly veiled in symbolic language, journalists added their own commentary and interpretations in their newspapers. Unfortunately, lead typesetting and the tight columns of newspapers did not allow clear delineation for the readers to distinguish exact quotes from the La Salette apparition and mere comments, and not just a few journalists were so indiscreet in their zeal as to modify the text to fit their interpretations. For the next three decades, from 1878 until her death in 1904, from her desk in Italy, Melanie kept up a massive correspondence, protesting bad additions and crazy commentary. Some Frenchmen made a witty remark in the early 20th century to the effect that the massive volume of publications on the secret of La Salette was only exceeded by its mediocrity. Please be advised that many, if not most, of the so-called prophecy experts who appear on the internet are making fools of themselves by quoting mistranslations from that era, which keeps getting reprinted in books from decade to decade. When our English translation of Father Laurentarn's archive collection is published, these experts will hopefully remove their videos. I think it's important to begin by an overview of the context of the secret. In what context was the state of the church in France and the world of the late 1800s? In what context had France and the world received Marian apparitions prior to La Salette? And in what context did Our Lady deliver the secret within the apparition itself? Let's begin with the state of the church in France and the world. It's interesting that Mary wanted the secret of La Salette to be published in 58. She appeared to Bernadette in February of 1858. The French apparition in the popular Catholic memory of Catholics today is Lourdes. Everybody loves Lourdes, where miracles seem to be given so freely, even though Our Lady did deliver some serious messages during those 18 apparitions. Primarily, she called for penance, penance, penance. Mary made a loud statement by simply appearing in a city dump to a young Catholic girl who was living in starving conditions in a jail that the city deemed unfit for criminals, but it was okay to collect revenue by renting it to desperately poor families. What had gone wrong in a society with such deep Catholic roots? Catholic France had been decimated by the French Revolution of the 1790s. During the following century, it went through a series of upheavals in government. Then France lost a war with Prussia in 1870, then France lost 1.3 million fighting men in World War I, and she lost half a million citizens in World War II 
and half of those were men of military age. There was hardly anyone left to marry or to plow the fields for a hungry nation. The eldest daughter of the church was no longer a strong Catholic nation in 1858. The French Revolution was nothing like the American Revolution, which was essentially a revolt against British taxation. Both revolts were against an earthly monarchy, but the Americans did not throw off the rule from heaven. The Declaration of Independent States, we hold these truths to be self-evident, that all men are created equal, that they are endowed by their creator with certain inalienable rights. Americans were shooting the British. France was chopping off the heads of her own citizens and torturing farmers in the Vendée who wanted freedom to go to mass. The bloodbath in France was truly a reign of terror, and its goal was the destruction of the Catholic Church. Freemasons from England had begun setting up lodges in France back in 1725. The Grand Orient de France came to be regarded as the mother lodge of continental Freemasonry and was soon spreading anti-monarchical and anti-Christian ideas across Europe through more than 800 lodges and 300 chapters. Two papal edicts, that of Pope Clement XII in 1738 and that of Pope Benedict XIV in 1751, were never registered by the French Parliament and therefore never took effect. We can only imagine how many upper-class Catholics in the Parliament before the Revolution were secretly members of these lodges. So what Marian apparitions preceded La Salette? I've emphasized in many talks that with the quasi-exception of Guadalupe, Our Lady delivered no messages to the world until 1830, the year that mysteriously got stamped on the miraculous medal. She had been appearing for almost two millennia for the benefit of some individual or religious order or local population. All that changed in 1830. Catholics today consider it quite normal for the Queen of Heaven to give messages all over the world and for the world, but she herself has told us that she's appearing with world messages only for a short space in history to prepare us for momentous, even apocalyptic events. After that, her public mission, a prophetess, will come to an end. For 40 years, she appeared in France from Paris to pont maine Among many profound reasons for starting in France, let's be mindful that the French had colonized parts of Canada, Africa, and Asia and brought their language with them, thus hastening the spread of her messages. In 1830, Our Lady appeared in a Paris convent to a young sister, Catherine Labouret, to warn about the next attack against God, namely by communists. Now that the French monarchy was out of the way, the next stage of Masonic ideas could develop. Young Karl Marx was keenly interested in the revolutionaries that sprang up in the sectors of Paris called communes. Our Lady would give three gifts to the world to the Daughters of Charity the miraculous medal of the Immaculate Conception, the green scapular of Our Lady's sword-pierced heart, and the red scapular of Christ's passion. These treasures were indulgenced and propagated by church authorities, but the sisters remained hidden from the public, even from their own companions. Catholic appreciation for the miraculous medal has never waned, but this past summer of 2023, the Bishop of Madison gave fresh impetus to the blessings of the green scapular by consecrating a new shrine for the United States. In 1843, the cloistered Carmelite sister, Marie St. Pierre, began receiving requests for acts of reparation to the Holy Face for the insults given to God by violations for the first three commandments, especially blasphemy and the neglect of worship on Sunday. She was specifically given certain prayers to hurl as arrows against the communists because they blasphemously denied God. But the Bishop of Tours would not propagate these prayers. Many bishops were more aligned with the worldly ideals of Freemasons and secular politics than with heavenly and eternal matters. In early September of 1846, the nun begged Our Lady to find another messenger. She prayed, O Holy Virgin, I implore you to come to some pious soul in the world and make her a partaker of that which has been communicated to me. 
As she prayed that very month of September 1846, on the 19th, as the Vesper bells of the Feast of Our Lady's Sorrows were ringing in monasteries, two young French shepherds up in the Alps came across a luminous lady who was seated on a plateau called the Salette. When they approached, she stood and invited them to draw near. Come forward, my children, don't be afraid. I am here to announce to you great news. She spoke to them a long time on that Saturday afternoon while her tears never stopped flowing. She was visibly distressed that people were taking God's name in vain and neglecting Sunday Mass. She concluded her discourse by declaring, if they convert, the stones and rocks will change into wheat. But then she asked the children, have you ever seen spoiled wheat? As she ascended into heaven, she repeated twice, well, my children, you will pass this on to all my people. Notice the Christmas scene at Bethlehem. A messenger from heaven says, be not afraid. Behold, I bring you good news of a great joy which will come to all the people. At Bethlehem and La Salette, we see poor shepherds who receive either good tidings or great tidings, and they are expected to pass the news to all the people. It's the birth of a new era, and birth pangs can be difficult. In the New Testament and the Septuagint, good news is basically one Greek word, which looks and sounds pretty much like evangelium, the English root for evangelize. Our Lady used a bigger word at La Salette, Grand Nouvelle. It's best translated into English as great because it carries positive and negative nuances. It can be tremendous news as something of enormous importance. It can be extensive news for a wide audience. And it can be bad news, as in Humpty Dumpty, who had a great fall. We can find all of these nuances in the afternoon encounter with the sorrowful mother of God. Before we examine the text of the secret, let's explore one more aspect of the context. In what context did Our Lady deliver the secret within the apparition? In this series, I want to focus on the secret. If you are not familiar with the main dialogue of the apparition of La Salette, books and videos abound on the so-called public message of La Salette. I'll put some links in the description box. As she did in the Carmelite convent of Tours, Our Lady complained about the sins against the first three commandments, and she explained the punishment the people might expect. At this point, she interrupts her dialogue to insert a long interlude, not musical, but a diatribe. Melanie relates that Our Lady had been saying, a great famine will come. Before the famine comes, children under the age of seven will begin to tremble and will die in the arms of those who hold them. Others will do penance through hunger. The nuts will go bad. The grapes will rot. At this point, said Melanie, I was enthralled with the lady's beauty. I ceased to hear her for a time. Nevertheless, I saw that she continued to move her lovely lips as though speaking. Maximin was receiving his secret. Little Memon was barely 11. He knew little of the catechism and was hardly ever taken to mass. Our Lady shared with him only a very condensed version of what Melanie would receive. So now we can begin the text of the grand news of the secret of La Salette. Let's read one and two together. One, Melanie, what I am about to tell you now will not always be secret. You can publish it in 58. Two, the priests, ministers of my son, the priests by their wicked manner of life, by their irreverence and impiety in celebrating the holy mysteries, by their love of money, love of honor and pleasures, priests have become cesspools of impurity. The sins of priests cry out for vengeance, and vengeance looms over their heads. Woe to those priests and persons consecrated to God, who by their infidelity and wicked lives are crucifying my son again. The sins of those consecrated to God scream to heaven and call for vengeance, and behold, vengeance is at their door, since there is no longer anyone to implore mercy and forgiveness for the people. There are no more generous souls, no one worthy anymore to offer the unblemished victim to the eternal on behalf of the world. Those are the opening lines. Talk about shock value. 
The style is straight out of the Old Testament. How does the book of Isaiah open? Sons have I reared, but they have rebelled against me. The ox knows its owner and the ass its master's crib. But Israel does not know. My people does not understand. The whole head is sick and the whole heart faint. You rulers of Sodom, you people of Gomorrah. The harsh style of the secret is proper to the prophetic era, that is, the 200 years preceding the fall of Jerusalem. Later in the secret, Our Lady announced that in 64, Lucifer, with a great number of demons, will be unleashed from hell. Are we sure that 1858 and 1864 were indicated when she was speaking in 1846? Or was she talking about 1958 and 1964? In 1858, France was in the midst of a government called the Second Empire, ruled by its third, Napoleon. He was walking a tightrope to please the conservatives who wanted the principles of Catholicism restored as the moral foundation of law, and liberals who wanted almost the opposite. Similar conflicts were happening in Italy with those who wanted to destroy the Vatican as a political power, and in the German states, which would end up starting the Prussian War, and give a humiliating defeat for France. In this era, conservatism was often conflated with authoritarianism, meaning that conservatives were more comfortable with a trusted leader to rule them than an untethered democracy, which could commandeer with the votes of immoral religious populace or commandeer the vote by an immoral and irreligious minority. As we said above, ideas of Freemasonry were permeating all of Europe along with Darwin's new theory of evolution, which suggested that the creator of the universe was rather unnecessary. But how bad were the priests in 1858? And how bad were the nuns? In the apparition, Our Lady had already complained of social sins, but she begins the secret by blaming the clergy and religious. Yet in this era, Catholic France was edifying the whole world with numerous religious congregations. France was sending missionaries out all over the earth, especially to countries where France had political influence, such as Asia, in a place we call today Vietnam, and in various countries of Africa. I'm drafting this script today on the feast of Charles de Foucault, who spent his last years living among Muslims in North Africa and praying for them until he was martyred there. Blessed Jean Jugon started the Little Sisters of the Poor, Vocations were so numerous that a virtual village was built to house the novices who received a year's training, then were sent out to found convents around the world to care for the elderly. The list of saints and blessed who emerged from France at this time is not just lengthy, it's breathtaking. In 1846, not many miles from La Salette, St. Jean Vianney was hearing confessions of people who traveled several days to get to his village and then waited in line for several more days. The French Catholic press was profoundly active. Lay Catholics were vociferous in their outrage at the indignities imposed on the Vatican by upstart Italian leaders. They gathered to sing songs in honor of blessed Pope Pius IX. That's what the world could see. But heaven could see the growing network of men who put on a Catholic face to the public but were secretly devotees of another ideology which richly rewarded them. The whole Masonic movement is a secret society, and here in France, Mary was telling a secret to children. It's almost humorous. She responded to stealth with stealth. This secret would drive the Masons half mad with anxiety and curiosity. And after the secret is eventually published, it contains hidden messages as if it's still in code. Now, because Freemasons run a secret society, we'll never be able to count with any degree of certainty the prelates who belong to it. We can assume that few among the lower clergy were members because they were not recipients of status and wealth. But bishops and archbishops and cardinals were on another level. Some were wealthy because they were descendants of the aristocracy, and even after the revolution, some families had retained some land, or rebuilt their fortunes with investments and new industries. But many of these churchmen were from ordinary backgrounds, yet had mysteriously been chosen for high positions in the church and enjoyed large houses and servants and abundant food amidst an often starving population. We do know for certain that Bishop Philibert de Briard was a saintly man. 
In his youth, he was a heroic confessor who stood near the guillotine to comfort those who were on their way to die. De Bruyard welcomed the news of the apparition at La Salette. He immediately set up a commission and five years later gave it his formal approval after consulting his clergy and the Pope. Despite his great age, he mounted a mule and made the difficult trek up the Alps to lay a foundation stone for the shrine. We also know for certain that the next four bishops who succeeded the saintly bishop behaved shamefully. To the dismay of the villagers, they drove Melanie far from the diocese. Indeed, they managed to get her excommunicated throughout France. They wanted full control of the shrine, and the priests who ran the gift shop mistreated the poor who could not afford the trinkets they sold. Rumors circulated that these four bishops died in tragic, even bizarre circumstances. Bishop Gunuliak, who was definitely responsible for driving the young Melanie into an English convent to keep her away from the pilgrims, died shortly afterwards in a lunatic asylum. His successor, Bishop Faba, was definitely responsible for rejecting the desire of Pope Leo that he implement the rule that Mary gave to Melanie and insisted instead on writing his own rule for his new congregation at La Salette. Moreover, we have ample testimony that Bishop Faba was very ambitious and had an inordinate love of money. In due time, he was found dead, stretched out on the floor, naked, with bulging eyes and clenched fists. Bishop Gilbert of Amiens, who witnesses attest that he had declared the secret of La Salette is nothing more than a tissue of profaneness, lies, and exaggerations, was shortly after found dead in his room, having collapsed to the floor. And during his funeral, his coffin fell off the catafalc and crashed to the floor. Over in Paris, Archbishop Darboy, who personally interrogated Maximin, causing him great psychological disturbance to try to force the secret out of him, became perturbed by not obtaining it. He said to Maximin before witnesses, the words of your beautiful lady contain stupidity and stupid will be your secret. Maximin responded, it is as certain that I have seen the beautiful lady as I am certain that before three years are out, you will have been shot. On May 24th, 1871, the archbishop was shot by the communists of Paris. He acknowledged what Maximin had said before dying of the wound. I don't know how to verify the circumstances in which the four bishops of La Salette met their earthly end. Perhaps they were pious fabrications or embellishments. But the fact that conservative Catholic laity believed the rumors and relished the idea that God had punished their own prelates reflects their conviction that the upper ranks of the clergy had achieved their appointments and bonuses by a secret closeness to the liberal Masonic government. Next time, we'll reread paragraph two and ask if this could also apply to 1958 and 1964. God bless you.